Hello, and thank you for joining the Chango Mini webinar series. Um, we call it a mini webinar because our goal is to get you on and off the phone here in uh, 30 minutes or less, whilst answering any questions that you might have on the topic of retargeting. Uh, my name is Dax Hammond, I'm CRO here at Chango, um, and today we're going to be covering a, a broad variety of topics with relation to retargeting. We're first of all going to start off by addressing the question of what retargeting is, but importantly, what retargeting is not. Um, many of you will know the term retargeting, but most of you will also associate it with this concept of site retargeting. The simple idea that an individual has been to your pages, has left, uh, a, a, perhaps abandoned a shopping cart, and then you use retargeting technology to find those people again in the hope of bringing them back and completing that transaction. It is true that that is one form of retargeting, but today we're going to talk about many other types, but we're going to focus on search retargeting and we're going to focus on programmatic site retargeting and walk you through those. Um, we're also going to deal with this topic of deduplication when it comes to addressing retargeting within uh, within your overall digital marketing mix, a topic that we're certainly passionate about. And at the end of the webinar, we'll point you to some additional resources in relation to looking at attribution modeling and how to measure retargeting correctly. As we go through the webinar today, you're more than welcome to use the, uh, the chat function to reach out to me directly. Uh, there should also be an option for you in the interface where you can raise your virtual hand, um, and I will address your questions primarily at the end of the session. If there's something that seems particularly relevant to the slide that we're on at the time, then I will try and address it for you right then. Uh, but if not, do send in your questions, and we will, uh, and we will deal with them at the end of the session. Uh, you'll also have my contact details at the end of the session as well, and if you wish to reach out to me directly either over email, phone, or Twitter, then you're more than welcome to, and we can all, always dive into your questions in more detail on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Before we jump into the details of the different types of retargeting, we have to understand why retargeting is changing from what you might be familiar with. First of all, there is this phrase that every um, journal in the industry seems to want to talk about right now, and that is this concept of big data. Big data itself isn't new. It's just newer to us in this industry as a term. And it's certainly one that you're going to be spending, uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about during 2013, um, and, uh, uh, and one that really you're going to have to understand the impact that it could have, but also what it's not. Because as an industry, we are pretty phenomenal at creating a fuss about something that doesn't necessarily need to have a fuss made about it, um, and so there are certainly uh, things true about that in relation to big data. Um, so the easiest way to think of big data, by definition, is it just means so much data that it's actually kind of cumbersome to use, which in itself is a bit of a silly definition because we're all talking about as an industry how big data is going to change our, uh, change our lives and change our campaigns. Um, but also we're defining it as something that isn't really actionable. And so I want you to think about it a little bit differently. Just think of big data as lots and lots of data, and then it kind of makes sense. As an industry and as marketers, we've always had the old um, analogy of wanting to target the right person at the right time with the right message. Well, the way in which we actually do that and make that become a reality is that we have to understand everything about our audience. And once we understand it, we can then cherry pick those individuals who are most relevant to us. That's kind of the promise of big data. It's that we're now going to have enough information about enough people to decide what their true value is and, um, uh, and decide who is most relevant to us. Big data itself, though, is problematic. And so this is where we get into the second favorite term of our industry right now, and that is what is programmatic. Think of programmatic simply as the mechanism or the solution that helps us solve big data. If we're saying big data is just lots and lots and lots of data that's kind of cumbersome to use, then programmatic is the set of tools or the ways of working or the ways of thinking that helps us actually make it actionable. And that's where we really get into what Django is. For many of you on the call, you will know Chango for what we're best known for in the industry, and that is creating and solving this problem of prospecting with search retargeting. 
Very briefly for now, search retargeting is the idea that an individual has searched on Google, Yahoo, or Bing, but who has not yet visited your site. And so these individuals are highly relevant and brand new to you. And we're going to come on and spend more time talking about that in a few minutes. Um, as the certainly the, the established leaders in that space, we actually have become the second largest source of search data in the United States. So right behind Google, we have more search data than Yahoo and Bing combined flowing through our system in every month. And it's the reason why marketers choose us for um, finding prospects based on keyword data. But more broadly for that, and, and perhaps a newer message than a lot of you on the phone will be familiar with uh, in relation to Django, is we solve this problem of programmatic in a variety of ways. First of all, we use programmatic and this idea of big data to prospect for new customers. And we do it with search retargeting, but we also now do it with the FBX uh, inventory, FBX being the Facebook exchange. We then help marketers increase conversion rates more efficiently with this concept of programmatic site retargeting, which we're going to visit. And then for several of the world's largest data owners and publishers, we actually have a trading desk in a box or audience extension type solution. And we really refer to that as being for those individuals or organizations that are very rich in data but perhaps poor in media. And then because we came from the agency side, and we used to hate that constant rotating door of vendors who the only time you'd hear from them is whenever they wanted a new I.O., then we wrap everything in true client services where all these client services individuals either come from an agency background and can speak that language, or they, uh, or they are real marketers themselves, and their job is to add strategic value to any individual's account. So moving on from us, when we talk about big data and when we talk about programmatic, we can't do so without referencing RTB or real-time buying or real-time bidding. And, and it's scaling significantly, which is helping a lot of these uh, solutions become possible. In 2012, we're somewhere around 24 to 30% of digital media being bought through RTB. By 2015, it's been widely accepted that it's going to be around 50%. I actually think now with the arrival of the Facebook exchange inventory, then it could be significantly uh, more than this 50% point. Um, the other thing that's fueling that growth is that RTB started off as the world of direct response marketers, but now brand marketers are starting to get in the action and saying, well, if there's all of this behaviorally targeted data um, available, then why can't we use that in order to do a more efficient awareness or branding buy? And so there are those two big market forces driving it forwards. But all of this can be pretty confusing to understand, and so there are two analogies depending on your background and interest that, I, that I'd give you to help you to understand this. Um, uh, the slide you should be seeing right now is, is from the Matrix series of films. And for those of you that remember these films, then it's about a, an individual who sees, the world, who sees the world for what it really is, and, and in their case, this world is made of code, and it's very false. And this is the exact moment in those films when Neo sees the world as code for the first time and stops seeing people as people and just sees them as these ones and zeros. Within digital marketing and RTB and programmatic, then that's kind of what I challenge you to do as marketers. We don't know who the individuals are we're targeting. We know an anonymous ID number, which we call a cookie, and we know lots and lots and lots of data about those individuals. And it's from that data that we build up our picture of the world and we build up our picture of the audience, and we decide who is relevant to target, but most importantly, how much value they have to us within that targeting. And that's where we start to get into what the truth about what retargeting really is. So at the very beginning, we touched on this idea of retargeting being not what marketers put it in the bucket of. Marketers generally hear the word retargeting and they think, oh, this is people who've been to my site and then left. And it's true. That is a type of retargeting. But what we want to do with our infographic is try and help you expand that way of thinking. And you can find this at chango.com forward slash seven types. And the infographic is divided in two. Um, on the right-hand side, first of all, we're talking about retargeting individuals who've been to any given marketer's site. This is what you're familiar with. Um, and as a consumer, even without your marketer's hat on, I'm sure there are many retailers, particularly in this busy Q4 period, where you've been to their site and you feel as though they're taking over your entire digital browsing experience now as they try and squeeze those last few Christmas dollars out of you in comparison to any of their competitors. 
And so site retargeting is very prominent and is certainly the largest of the spends within the retargeting world. Down in the bottom right-hand corner of this infographic, though, is, is one of my favorites and fastest-growing retargeting techniques, and that's this idea of email retargeting. With email retargeting, what we're doing is putting pixels inside the marketing messages that we're sending out to um, customers' client base or prospecting base and adding those people to that cookie pool. And why not, right? Some of these individuals have never actually been to the client's site before. And so email retargeting can not only be helpful for retention, but it can also be helpful for um, new customer acquisition. And all that is happening simply is when the person opens the email um, and downloads the images, it is a, a requirement of dropping any pixel, then they're tagged and identified and can go into the retargeting pool. And because you know that they came from the email program, you can treat them differently. You can have a different value. You can um, uh, show them a different creative message, and you can consider them to be at a different part in the funnel. Uh, at a recent conference, I asked an audience probably of about three or 400 marketers how many were using email retargeting in 2012, and less than 10% put up their hand. I think 12, 18 months from now, we're going to see that number be well over, uh, well over half. And on the left-hand side, this is where the kind of challenging to your thinking begins because retargeting is also about prospecting. Um, search retargeting we'll come on to in a moment, but, but let's pause for a minute and look at the one down in the bottom left-hand corner, which is this idea of contextual retargeting. Contextual retargeting is the exact same technology, if you will, and the same mechanism for doing site retargeting, but instead of retargeting people who've been to your site, you're finding contextually relevant sites and asking if you can retarget their audience. Now, for some of you, that might sound pretty out there. You, know, you might consider yourselves a, a large and protected brand and think you wouldn't necessarily do that. But um, uh, not that long ago, I brokered a deal between uh, three travel organizations. One was a destination, one was an airline, and one was a hotel chain. And each of these organizations operates completely separately to each other. They're all major brands in their own space that you would be aware of. But they, in many ways, operated in a symbiotic relationship. The hotel wanted people to come, so they cared about the airline's audience. The destination wanted the hotel owners to be happy with their revenue, and of course, they also cared, therefore, about what the airline was doing. And the airline wanted a chance to target anybody who'd booked their hotel first, rather than booking the airline first, so that they could have a chance to sell them a plane ticket. What we did was we took a site retargeting pixel from each of those three companies' existing campaigns and brokered a situation in which they, re they put those retargeting pixels on each other's pages on the sections that were relevant. And now those three brands have the opportunity to reach a new audience that is highly relevant to them at no additional cost and is favorable to all three parties. And so contextual retargeting can exist in many surprising ways. Um, but we're going to skip right up to the top left-hand corner of this infographic, and we're going to focus a little bit more on search retargeting. And search retargeting and site retargeting are complementary. They are not contradictory to one another. Search retargeting is used to prospect and add to the funnel. Site retargeting should be sitting there churning away at the bottom of the funnel and driving increased conversion. So as we briefly mentioned, search retargeting is this idea that an individual has gone to Google, Yahoo, or Bing and has done a search that is relevant to your business. They have not yet visited your site, and so this is a brand new audience. It's unfortunate that the term search retargeting has become used in several other uh, ways within the industry, um, some talking about using second-tier search engine data, some talking about um, being reliant on um, toolbar data, some talking about just getting data from vertical um, shopping search search engines. When you think about search retargeting, you should be thinking about being as close to an original and high quality source of data, such as a Google, Yahoo, or Bing search as you possibly can be. And to help explain search retargeting, we often use this analogy that the term itself is our blessing and our curse. And honestly, if we could restart this micro industry again, we'd, we'd probably pick a different name. Um, we say it's our blessing and our curse because we go talk to marketers and we say the phrase search retargeting, and they get all excited. And they say, great, search and retargeting are both things that I know that work. Um, uh, we should be doing them. But it's a curse because they hear the term search and they hear the term retargeting and they say, but I'm already doing search marketing and I'm already doing site retargeting. And so we often spend a lot of time talking about what search retargeting is not. And what it is not is talking to those people who've already been to your pages. 
So you can imagine the flow with search retargeting. An individual goes to um, Google, let's say they type in um, a laptop Christmas gift, um, and they ignore, let's say, I don't know, the Amazon ad or the Best Buy ad, and they click through to, uh, to some other sites. Amazon and Best Buy, both as organizations, care very much about somebody who searched for that term. And so with search retargeting, they could show their own relevant ads to that individual as they browse around the web um, and try and win a second chance to bring those individuals back to their own sites. Great thing is there's no restriction on competitive brand terms within search retargeting, so you can conquest against competitors or you can conquest against uh, partners who are more or less dominant than you in, in whichever industry is relevant. And whilst we find about half of our customer base is retailers, we also find this to be extremely popular with travel brands, uh, personal finance brands, um, education lead generation amongst many, many other types of techniques. Because for the first time in this industry, in all this noise of everybody claiming that search plus display is this magical one plus one equals three uh, phenomena, this is really the first time the intent of search is being married with the reach and the capability of display. And that reach and capability, of course, is only increasing when you look at that RTB growth chart we've reviewed a few slides back, um, or we think about the arrival of the Facebook exchange and all of the inventory that brings with it. So switching gears a little bit, search retargeting, it's all about prospecting, finding new people. Site retargeting, as we've touched on many times already, is the idea that somebody's already been to your pages. But most site retargeting programs, when we look at them, include a significant amount of wasted impressions. Those wasted impressions are there for two reasons. First of all, they're there for a good reason, and that is, uh, or at least they're in a reason that has a good intention, and that is that a marketer is looking at their results and feeling that their site retargeting program is operating well, and so therefore why not include, uh, in keep increasing the spend to try and generate more value from it. But site retargeting is also overstuffed and sometimes full of wastage for a, for a bad reason, and that is that sometimes the models under which site retargeting companies work incentivize that company to spend more and more rather than invest those dollars smarter. And so we get into this situation where as marketers, Several of you already feel as though you're being stalked by certain brands across the web who are showing you too many impressions, particularly after you've already gone on and converted. Um, so with programmatic site retargeting, it's the natural evolution from what we've had before. With standard site retargeting, it's a simple relationship. Someone triggers a pixel by visiting a page, they leave, you show them an ad. With advanced site retargeting, what we had for a number of years is this idea of, well, if they've looked at a certain product, most commonly used in retail at the SKU level, then let's show them a customized or personalized dynamic ad that shows that product. That generated a great increase in the overall performance, but still wasn't really taking into account the actual value an individual uh, actually has to the program and whether they should be targeted at all. And so when we talk about programmatic site retargeting, what we're doing is saying, well, there is more data to know about these people. And with that increased amount of data, we can determine real value. So let me give you an example. Let's say you are a home improvement retail store. Somebody arrives on your site on a Friday afternoon and they are searching for new kitchen. You know they're searching on the term new kitchen because with the right technology, not only can you see they visited the new kitchen pages, but they also arrived from Google with the referring URL that says they just searched for the term new kitchen. Or if you combine it with a technology like ours, even if they didn't arrive using that search term, we know from their history that they searched on new kitchen. That person is likely to make a ten to fifty thousand dollar purchase decision over the next seventy two hours. Compare that to somebody who arrives on a Sunday morning searching for the term how to hang wallpaper. That person has probably already made their purchases, they probably already have their paper and their paste and their brushes. That person is looking for information and guidance. What will typically happen, even in a personalized advanced site retargeting program, is both individuals will be treated in a very similar fashion. One will be shown kitchen ads and one will be shown wallpaper ads. The problem with that is you're ignoring all of the signal, you're ignoring all of this big data that you know about these individuals. Why wouldn't you 
site retarget the individual searching for new kitchen on a Friday at a budget of fifteen, twenty, twenty-five dollars CPM. Really, you know, if they're going to make that big a decision, does it really matter what price you're? bidding at given the few number of impressions you're really likely to serve? And do you not want to saturate their experience for 48 hours and then start to tailor that experience down during the following week? In comparison to the wallpaper person who, quite frankly, they've already made their purchase and you might have a lot of content out there for your social marketing that you might like to get more traffic to. And so you might say, well, let's retarget that person with a simple five cent CPM bid. And if we find them, we find them. If we don't, we don't. Or you might say, well, that person has no value to me at all this quarter because they've already made their purchases. When you use more data or big data um, and you use this programmatic approach with a few simple lines and com combined rules, you can actually build up a situation where you're taking into account all of this information. Everybody has their own value. Everybody has their own score. And something like this might sound complex, but something like this is also available on a complete full service basis, and so you don't necessarily need to worry about all the details of it. But of course, it is more hands-on than a typical site retargeting buy because we'd give you strategists that can help you tease out and understand what this first-party data is and how it should best be used. I do want to give you one um, word of warning, though. I, I love this quote. Stalking is when two people go for a long romantic walk together, but only one of them knows about it. The idea behind this is that um, as marketers, there is a temptation to overinvest in retargeting because it looks so good and the numbers are so high in comparison to a lot of other things you do. Just be careful. Consumers know what's going on. They don't want to be saturated with your ads. Make sure you remove them from the pool um, once they've gone on and done the conversion it is that you wanted them to do. Um, I do want to touch on the arrival of the Facebook exchange. The Facebook exchange is close to a billion users worldwide, um, uh, reachable through the exchange. It's probably going to represent 25% of all US ad impressions. It does typically have much lower CPMs than a lot of other exchange inventory. And there are some interesting stats around it, such as um, when you show people ads in Facebook exchange, then they tend to convert quicker than anywhere else. Um, so it's very favorable for marketers. And so we built out the concept of programmatic FBX um, advertising because, again, we're taking all of that big data, in our case, lots and lots and lots of search intent data, and deciding who has value to us in FBX and, and what that value is. Logically, FBX is just another exchange media source. Illogically, but probably the right thing to do for now, it's something very different. We don't necessarily understand yet how it's going to behave. We don't yet know exactly how Facebook will evolve this over the next six to 18 months. And so it's best to pick a, a separate solution such as uh, programmatic FBX advertising in order to put this in a separate bucket so you can use different messaging strategies. Um, all your testing basically begins back from scratch again. Um, I do see a couple of questions coming in. You can remember use the interface in order to do that through the, uh, through the chat function. Um, and there's a question actually that's very timely that's just come in uh, around the overlap in different types of retargeting. So what I'm going to do is immediately jump over and we're going to talk about this topic of um, deduplication and attribution. Deduplication and attribution are two separate things, but of course uh, intrinsically linked. When we talk about deduplication, we're primarily talking about those marketers who are using an ad server, such as a DoubleClick or an Atlas or a MediaPlex, in order to help them manage their display marketing programs. Um, for those of you not as familiar with these ad servers, then they're there to make sure you're getting um, the impressions that you've paid for. They're there as a third-party independent source um, for the media seller and the media buyer to, uh, to know what's happening. And then they help with creative management. These ad servers typically um, will try and do an attribution model that is one of last touch. And if you think about the funnel we talked about a few slides back of search retargeting is for prospecting and brings in brand new people, and site retargeting is to try and get them to convert if they happen to abandon, then hopefully you can start to see the problem of when deduplication occurs. Site retargeting is always going to win the credit because it's designed to be the last touch. And we see this time and time again where there will be discrepancies between a prospecting type by number and the number of 
conversions that shows up in something like a double click or an atlas. And that's because the tools are working correctly just as marketers were using them wrong typically and not understanding what it is. It would be like saying, well, I'm going to put all my money in my site retargeting and I'm going to cancel all my other advertising buys, whether they be TV, radio, newspaper, um, online branding, email marketing, etc. Suddenly you're going to have nobody new coming into the funnel. And it's a big topic, so if any of you are um, confused by this, then do please feel free to, uh, to reach out, and I'm happy to discuss it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's somewhat of a personal mission, if you will, to try and educate as much of the industry as, as to why this is happening, because it means marketers are making bad decisions about budget allocation. And so the, the diagram on the screen here is, is what's called a PSA or a public service announcement test, otherwise just call an A-B test. And it's one way to measure the incremental uplift of the programs that you're running. So up in the top left-hand box labeled uh, number one, what we're saying is we're going to divide an audience in two. One of the audience is going to see our branded campaign ad and the other half of the audience is going to see something completely irrelevant, a PSA or a charity ad, for instance. We know that the people who see the branded ad can be influenced to go shop at that brand. That's how advertising works. We also know that the people who are seeing the charity ad will not be influenced by the charity ad to go shop at our retailer client's store because we know that uh, there's no message being carried in that that's relevant or could influence them or tip them off to that in any shape or form. And so what we're doing in the right-hand box here labeled 2 is we're saying, well, we're going to work out what is the percentage difference. So let's say our branded ads generate $1,000 in revenue, but our non-branded ads, our charity or control group ads, generate $100 in revenue. That means that that $100 would have been bought on that brand anyway, whether we showed the ads or not. And so the difference between the 1,000 and the 100 means that we have a 90% incremental uplift. And I'll show you a link in a few moments to, uh, to where you can download more white papers on this information to, uh, to try and help you uh, over that. Um, and so let's jump into our final point of um, the five tips that we promised you around improving your retargeting. First of all, I hope everyone on this call now understands the difference between what retargeting is and what retargeting is not. Retargeting is not just site retargeting, it can also be used for prospecting. And so you want to bring brand new people into your funnel right now before the holidays or you want to bring them in during Q1, search retargeting is the way to do that, combining search intent data with the reach of display. Secondly, don't settle for the site retargeting program that you have, I can guarantee that you can find wastage in that program and have it eliminated. And it gets addictive. Once you start finding the wastage, then you want to start removing more and more of it, and you realize that a programmatic approach using more data is really the only way to do it. As a quick tip, you might want to start using exclusion pixels on things like your careers page or your corporate about pages, because chances are that's showing you somebody is not a shopper, that person is somebody who is interested in a different type of intent. Third one is about measuring conversion windows and frequency caps. You know, we talked about this idea of um, it sometimes feels to consumers like they're being stalked by marketers and brands. There are ways to measure the number of impressions that you should be serving to that to any given individual in a campaign. If you really want a general benchmark rule, then something like seven impressions per individual per day for seven days. Think about the number seven. It's not a bad start. I, I always hesitate to give that example because every case is different, but it's certainly going to be a better consumer experience than a lot of what's happening today. Um, become aware of the deduplication problem and the attribution problem and the ways in which it can be um, measured. If you Google the phrase, three simple alternatives to attribution modeling, um, then you'll find an article we published on Search Engine Land. And then also if you visit um, chango.com slash resources, you'll find um, free white papers that you can download on that subject as well. And then the fifth is, you know, we have become known in this industry as the people who solve programmatic. And so whether you're talking about search retargeting or programmatic site retargeting or now the launch of programmatic FBX advertising to take advantage of the new Facebook exchange opportunity, then feel free to give us a call and we will be happy to talk to you. So um, 
we're just about approaching our 30 minutes. Um, feel free to stay on the call longer if you want to hear us address some of the questions that have come in. We will do so probably for another five minutes or so. Um, but you have my contact details on the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, just dax at chango.com. Um, happy to address those one-on-one. -on -one. Chango.com forward slash resources for our white paper series. And then below that, you'll see we've just announced a date, January 23rd, which is our next mini webinar 30-minute um, uh, presentation. And in this case, it's going to be about marrying the intent data of search with the FBX inventory source. Um, and so for those of you who are leaving us at the 30-minute point, thank you very much for joining us. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, and for those of you who are going to stay on for a few more minutes, we'll address a few questions that have come in here um, and uh, uh, go through those. So our first question that we have, uh, can you explain ways that retailers can identify unique winners in attribution overlapping that will surely develop from email retargeting? Uh, we may normally be newsletter for us, but with this, the newsletter may actually be the first, an email retarget may be the last. What are the best practices here? So l let me say that question back in, in another way. Um, I think really the question here is if you're using site retargeting and if you're using email retargeting, um, then what do you do about the overlap between those two? Um, primarily what I'd say is you need to make smart use of what's called exclusion um, pixels or exclusion cookies um, and understand um, through whichever system you're using for retargeting where these people were being added to your pool, when they were being added to that pool, and, and then work out where they are uh, mapped into the funnel so you can determine the right messaging. There's going to be a lot of small marketers on this call who don't necessarily uh, aren't using a tool that has that capability. There's some limited functionality to that extent in Google, for instance, but it's not necessarily going to solve that problem. Um, you're always going to have some sort of overlap um, is, the, uh, uh, is the key thing to be aware of. Trying to measure it and trying to, uh, to eliminate it is one way, but just um, understanding it and deciding what messaging is right given the order that you're going to retarget people is probably a, um, a, better, uh, uh, a better use of your time. Um, next question is, can you give examples of how affiliate publishers are disputing some attribution overlaps which may impact commission distribution? Has it been a point of contention yet? Um, yes, very, very much so. Um, obviously, an affiliate marketer is, uh, is trying to earn revenue from any given brand and they're being paid out for any conversion that they drive. If the affiliate contract, for instance, says that those numbers will be measured through a third-party tool such as DoubleClick, then if you wanted to be an unethical brand, all you'd have to do is start site retargeting all of your traffic and you could start to claim the victory for yourself. Um, I used to be heavily involved in affiliate marketing and, and know that that world is, is surprisingly cutthroat. And so um, you can use attribution models to, to show almost any um, set of numbers that you want to. I think the only way to really solve it in the case of the affiliate where you don't have control of the site or full view of all of the statistics is to make sure that your contract is very robust up front and it's very clear over what set of numbers you're going to be measured against and how those numbers could be, um, uh, how those numbers could be uh, affected. Um, next question from Kristen. Uh, how should we think about the differences between search retargeting data from first-party sources like Google, Yahoo, versus data from third-party publishers who are selling the data about the queries that got to their sites? Is the first-party data significantly better? What I would say about the quality of data is it comes down to a couple of things. It certainly comes down with search data to being very close to the source. Um, and then it also comes down to um, the site on which it's being collected. Um, so when we think about the source, then what we care about is those events that have taken place on Google, Yahoo, or Bing. We're seeing the event because the person's clicking on the link. The engines themselves are typically seeing the events in the same way. So even someone like Google who's experimented with this, they're not looking at the searches that have taken place on Google.com. What they're looking at is the incoming referrer traffic to the GDN, the, the Google Display Network. It's the exact same sources, our data, we have a lot of that data, but then we have 
10x that source of data through through a variety of other publishers as well. Um, being close to that source really matters. Um, there are other sources of that data, but that can be several steps away, and it's resold data, and it doesn't have the same type of value because you don't understand how that data may have been changed um, before it eventually came to you. You also have to be careful with organizations who are packaging up search data and selling it in, in cookies and, and beha limited behavioral targeted groups because then you get into this problem of everybody trying to buy the same intender group and you artificially inflate the, uh, the media cost. And then we have one final question right now, um, which is around uh, FBX Creative. So as we said, FBX Programmatic FBX advertising um, is Chango's solution to solving the FBX opportunity, using lots and lots of search data, among other things, to decide who to target and at what value. The FBX creative inventory is a different size. Uh, off the top of my head, I think it's 99 by 72 pixels. Um, and uh, it includes some text and includes an image. So a lot of brands won't have that format of creative just lying around. You know, for us as a company, we had to deal with that and, and now provide a full, free, creative um, in-house solution specifically for that FBX advertising just to help those brands overcome that problem until, until this kind of becomes a more standard ad um, format for them. And it looks like that's the end of our questions um, that have come in through the webinar interface. As I say, dax at chango.com if you wish to uh, reach out with any other questions. Feel free to email sales at chango.com and we will happily talk to you about any of these solutions. Chango.com slash resources for uh, our white papers. We have hopefully written them with the promise that it is, they are no good for insomniacs. We have been told that they are a much lighter, more interesting read, so feel free to go download those. And then come back to our site on Friday of this week where you'll be able to register on Django.com for our next mini webinar, which is Search Meets Social Prospecting with FBX, and that will take place on January 23rd. Um, happy holidays, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Please stand by.